my name is David Ettery. Um, I actually have two businesses. I, I run a consulting firm called Fuzzbee, which is uh, it's, uh, to help people with uh, it, all forms of digitally distributed games. And then uh, I just also started a studio called Spry Fox, uh, which uh, we'll actually be making a formal announcement about tomorrow. So we're very excited about that. And that's focused all, almost entirely on, uh, it's entirely on digitally distributed and, and online games, but we, we, with a kind of the majority of the focus is specifically on free-to-play web-based games. So it depends on the client, but um, some of our clients we help with, um, we actually re represent to publishers. So if you're trying to get onto Xbox Live Arcade or PSN, for example, we'll, we'll help you refine your, your concept, help you produce a pitch, help you deliver that pitch to the publishers, and then help you negotiate with publishers. And the publishers, of course, includes the first party of the platform that themselves. Um, so that's that's a large part of the business. Um, another part of the business is helping people just simply with design, like specifically with monetization things. So if they're developing a free-to-play game, how to improve their monetization, how to improve their, their viral mechanisms to attract customers. Uh, if it's an XPLA game, maybe a lot of the focus will be on how to make the best trial so you have a good conversion rate, um, you know, marketing strategy, those sorts of things. Um, so that's a, another part of the business. And then the third part of the business is related to a book I wrote um, a couple years ago called Changing the Game. Um, and Changing the Game was essentially, it was how video games are transforming the future of business. And so we're, we're working with non-traditional uh, companies, uh, like, or I should say traditional companies that are not in the entertainment space, like uh, um, Microsoft is a good example. Not the entertainment group, but Microsoft Office group, for example. I'm working with uh, uh, to, uh, to make a game, uh, the second version of the game called Ribbon Hero, which is designed to teach people how to use Microsoft Office, um, which is a very, it's an interesting and challenging problem. Uh, so, you know, working on that, for example, working, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, with a company like a Procter & Gamble or, or a T-Mobile, those are the kinds of customers that we have on that, you know, that side of the business. In my perspective on the, the free-to-play, specifically the Flash-based flash free-to-play gaming space, so, you know, web games using Flash, so they're totally accessible, uh, my perspective on that space is, in many ways, it's, it's probably the most attractive um, opportunity in games in, in, I don't know, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, when you look at the flash space, you're looking at a space that has 10x or probably substantially more the number of potential gamers available to you that are, exist on even the most popular console, right? I mean, even if you have the, you know, the PS2 with 100 million plus units out there, you know, there's probably a billion plus people with Flash in their browser who might be willing to play a game, right? Which is, of course, why the most popular console game will sell 10 million copies and Farmville will reach 80 million people. And, you know, that's that's that explains the discrepancy, um, but everyone's focus in our industry seems to be on the social gaming side of things because I, I think they just assume that the reason these other games have become so popular is because they're integrated into Facebook and they use the social graph and this, obviously that's that's a large part of it. But I think people are missing the larger point, which is the major one of the major reasons those games have succeeded is because they have zero barrier to entry. They're written in Flash or HTML. So anyone can play them instantly. There's never any issue with, uh, with uh, you know, downloading a plugin or anything like that. And they're free to play. And they have good, good monetization systems. And that's very, very largely why those games have succeeded. Um, and yet, despite the fact that those games have done so well, um, all the genres, all the other genres, you know, the less casual genres, the less uh, you know, things that aren't necessarily asynchronous uh, multiplayer games, et cetera, et cetera, those things are, you know, are almost those fields lie almost completely unplowed, right? I mean, you have. I mean, pick any major genre, and at most you'll be able to find maybe one or two really, really good free-to-play Flash-based games in that genre. Um, and when you think about the fact that there's this enormous, enormous, enormous potential audience, and that it's really easy to reach through, you know, th the thousand-plus Flash por portals out there that are desperate for content, uh, and how little competition there is, it's actually kind of a staggering opportunity um, when you think about it. So we have a game, for example, called Steambirds, and Steambirds was made in by you know two guys in a very, very short period, like a m couple months. Um, and uh, with no marketing, no promotion, they just threw it out there in the Flash portals. And today, Steambirds has been played by well over 10 million people. This is a game that, because it was a concept test, it was just a, a, a little experiment that, the, you know, that my two partners working on it uh, put together. It has no monetization system. They just threw it out there. They wanted to see how it would work. Like I said, again, no marketing, no promotion. And yet, they reached that many people. Now, imagine taking that exact same game you know, making it a little bit richer, a little bit deeper, adding in some good monetization systems, doing a little bit to promote it. You know, how much money could you possibly make? How many people could you possibly reach? It's, as far as I'm concerned, dramatically more exciting than anything I could be doing on any other platform. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone disagrees that retail is eventually going to wane. I mean, it has already started a little bit. Um, 
So uh, the question really for most, in most people's minds is just when is it going to happen? And, and in my opinion, the companies that aren't paying pretty significant amount of attention, not just to digital in general, but specifically the changing business models, the new platforms, et cetera, et cetera, those people are going to be in a lot of trouble, right? Because it's not, it's not like just taking the game that used to be in retail and instead putting it on you know, a downloadable service and you're done, right? The, the ways you promote the games are different. You know, in many ways, like I said, if you're looking at the free-to-play space, the business model is completely different. Um, and it takes, it takes a certain amount of experience to understand how to succeed in those environments. It's no surprise that the vast majority of third-party publishers haven't done really well in Xbox Live Arcade. The vast majority of hits on the servers are still published directly by Microsoft. And there's a very simple reason for that, because publishers aren't investing the kind of time and effort into understanding how those spaces work. And in, you know, if you ask them, I don't know what they say about that today, but if you would have asked them two or three years ago why that is, they would have said, well, it's small potatoes and you can't make that much money there. But at the same time, in the same breath, they would say, oh, but digital distribution is the future. Then what are you doing? You know, what, are you, what are you thinking? Why aren't you picking up the experience and trying to get ahead of your competitors? Um, and so that's, you're starting to see some changes there. I mean, Electronic Arts in particular has made it very clear that they're committing heavily to the downloadable game space. Um, and they bought Playfish, so obviously they're committing heavily to free-to-play, um, although in their minds it's probably more social games than free-to-play. But they are doing other things. I mean, they did Battlefield Online. They've tried to experiment. And so, you know, I, it's funny. I never would have imagined myself saying this four years ago, but I'm actually quite impressed with EA in the sense that, like, that they're, they're clearly trying. They're clearly making an effort, whereas other publishers, um, Activision's a good example. You know, if it wasn't for Blizzard, you wouldn't really be able to say that much about their efforts, right? I mean, they're they're complete, almost completely absent on Xbox Live Arcade. Not you know, uh, not entirely, but almost. They they are doing DLC. Okay, yes, they're doing map packs for Call of Duty and whatnot. So at least they have that. But nothing in the free-to-play space. Nothing in uh, almost nothing on Xbox Live Arcade, PSN, and, uh, and I, you know, I I just can't can't understand how, how how they consider that a viable strategy. I guess they just figured they'll go out and buy someone eventually, like they did with Blizzard. So, and maybe that will work. But uh, in the meantime, I'm. I'm uh, I'm impressed with EA and not too terribly impressed with most of the other publishers, frankly, in this space. Well, it depends, right? So, it's on Xbox Live Arcade and PSN. Not everybody can. You have to get your, you have to fight your way in. And on Xbox Live Arcade, it's actually can be quite difficult. Um, that said, you're absolutely right. It's more cluttered, no question, more cluttered than the retail environment. Uh, and so that just means certain things are more important than they ever were before. They always were important, but I mean, marketing and PR, right? Marketing and PR always really mattered, but now. It makes all the difference. Now it's now you know having a pretty box with a with a recognizable name on it isn't necessarily going to save you. You really need people to recognize the fact that your game is something special because they've heard about it multiple times before it came out. And again, I mean not just once. That's another thing is that a lot of re, a lot of retail uh, pu focused publishers have gotten used to this idea that you know soon before your game comes out you can do this sort of shock and awe marketing campaign and get everyone to be excited about your game. But in digital, what we found is <coughs> digital downloadable space specifically. What we, what we found is that you need to be marketing your game f f over a fairly long period of time, kind of repeating it over and over and again in the press so that consumers hear about it multiple times, kind of get it set in their head so that when the game comes out they say, ah, I heard about that, I recognize that, I want to play that, right? And that's something that, again, a lot of publishers just don't have a tremendous amount of experience with. And, and some indies, you know, indies are, are the ones who are showing the way, which is, you know, kind of a wonderful surprise, right? So you look at a game like Castle Crashers or Brave, uh, uh, you know, or uh, you know, any of the more recent games like a Twisted Pixels Comic Jumper, which is about to come out. Yeah, I mean, these are games. Well, Scott Pilgrim's a special case, but 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 in the the you know these these indie titles, they've been they get promoted way way in advance of coming out. And the indie, you know, and indies make a very significant uh, another one, Monday Night Combat, which was recently in the summer of arcade. That's a game that uh, whose developer Uber spent you know many 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 months. Trying hard to get repeat impressions from on, on in the press, they would release cute little you know videos. They would release. They actually there's an animator on their team who also does stunts, and so they would show videos of him doing stunts, and then show him animating those same stunts in the game. I mean, they were doing all these kinds of clever stuff. And the idea was again very simple. It was how many times can I get people to hear about my game before it comes out over a pretty over a long period of time? And no surprise, Monday Night Combat is a very successful game. Um, so yeah, I mean, publishers can learn a lot from what indies are doing in this space. Uh, so like I was mentioning earlier, it's. Uh, it's all about how businesses can use games, and so that's there's that's we broke that into you know a few different parts. One one part was obviously advertising, and that's kind of the the thing that everybody understands the most: product placements in games, advert games, that sort of thing. Um, I think that uh, in general, both of those things, product placements and advert games, and uh, and other forms of advertising related to games, have kind of a bad reputation in the industry. People assume if it's 
if it's an adverb game, it's crap. Um, and so we just wanted to give examples in the book of adverb games that you know it may not have been the best games ever, but had you know were not bad and had a really really positive effect. And um, I mean, I just a lot of examples, but I guess my favorite is the Burger King Xbox games, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, you know, they were actually reasonably fun, despite the fact that there were three games produced in a fairly short period of time, which is not easy to do on the console, especially when you're compatible with both Xboxes, which was not easy. Um, um, but more, you know, more as opposed to talking about the games, which anyone can go and read about online, I'll, I'll mention something that a lot of people haven't heard, which is that the quarter that those games were released, um, Xbox's, uh, excuse me, uh, Burger King's profit, quarterly profits went up 40%. Uh, and it's attributed almost entirely to the games. Not because the games were sold, they were, they were sold for, I can't remember, three or four bucks or something, um, which in and of itself covered the cost of the promotion, but because so many people wanted the games um, that, that it drove a tremendous amount of traffic to the Burger King restaurants. And of course, while you're there, you're not going to just buy the game, you're also going to buy a sand, you know, hamburger, right? So, you know, yeah, it, it was an enormous, enormous, enormous spike. Uh, in, in their quarterly profits. It's probably the most successful ad game promotion in history. Um, and, and most people have no idea. Like most people are like, oh yeah, I remember those Burger King games, they were okay. Like, you know, but they, it's really, really an incredibly powerful promotion for that company. So that's part of the book. Um, part of the book is about how you can use games to uh, educate and train people. And we have a bunch of different examples. I mean, we have examples from the military because they're one of the most proactive uh, users of games in this space. Um, but we also have examples of, like, in business school, how there's a game that, called Everest that they use to teach people teamwork skills, where, like, people have to climb Everest virtually and, and work together. And, you know, and they learn, you know, a lot of teams fail, and they learn, and the game is tri tries to teach them why did you fail and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's very interesting. Um, and another part of the book is using games for, uh, for boosting productivity uh, and for crowdsourcing. And that's a topic that's very near, dear to my heart. Actually, uh, one of the panels in this conference, they talked about a game called Fold It, um, which is a game uh, created by the University of Washington. Uh, and the way it, work, it works basically is uh, today, if you want to figure out how a protein, a protein has, can have, um, I, I forget the exact number, but a protein can be folded in billions of different possible ways. You know, they have lots and lots of different combinations. And the, the structure of a protein, the physical way it's folded, dictates what it does. It has, you know, it, as opposed to just the, the, what it's comprised of. Um, so you can have a computer figure out for you how a protein is folded, but it takes an enormous amount of time because the computer just does pure brute force. It just tries every possible combination of folds and eventually it gets to the right one and it takes it forever, even a really powerful computer. And what the guys at University of Washington realize is that human beings with our pattern matching abilities uh, are currently way ahead of computers in this particular kind of task. We can figure out how a protein folds much faster than a computer can, but the guys at University of Washington can't sit around and fold proteins all day. So instead what they did is they made a game out of it and they put the protein in there and they teach the player what the basic rules of protein folding are and they're like, okay, it's like a puzzle. Go, fold it and you'll get points for every protein that you fold correctly. Um, and this game has been an enormously successful thing for them. They've got tons of people online playing this game, doing essentially free work for them, faster than any computer could do it. Um, and that's an amazing, amazing, amazing example of using games not only to, to for, the, you know, for boosting productivity, for crowdsourcing, but frankly to make the world a better place. Right, so it's very, I mean, it's very, very inspiring to me. And, and there's lots of other examples, but so that's kind of the, the arc of the book.